So we're going to pick up and continue where we left off in talking about uh, the surface integrals. And, but before we do that, just a couple of quick announcements. All right. So when last we saw our intrepid heroes, we had done the whole derivation around surface integrals, but we hadn't actually crunched through anything. So again, I don't have the dot cam, so I'm just going to have to walk you through the pre-done notes here. Um, and I'm going to spend my time focusing in on the setup rather than the evaluation of integrals. So here, as we talked about yesterday, if we're trying to evaluate an integral where we have integrand x, y, z, and then it's ds, remember this is the big S uh, that's for surface area, um, the first step is going to still be to parametrize. And the good news with uh, the good news with surface area or surface integrals is that usually the parameterizations are given for you. And that certainly is the case here. I'm basically going to take that given stuff and write down my parameterization. Second step is to find ds. Um, thanks to Melissa for pointing out an error in my notes at the end of class yesterday. But to find the ds, I'm going to find tu and tv. Remember that tu is the partial derivative of r with respect to u. So all the u's are going away. And then tv is the partial derivative of r with respect to v. From here, we need our cross product, tu cross tv, and then we will I uh, use that to find the magnitude of the cross product. And so at the end of step two, we have a parameterization and we have a formula here for ds. Uh, ds would also have um, like a du, a du dv on the end if you want to think about this as a full uh, ds. Questions so far? Very good. So step three remains the same as what we've done in the past. We're going to simply substitute and integrate. So we had x, y, z, and we'll just simply substitute in. Here's our x, here's our y, here's our z, and then all this stuff here on the end, that's our d big S. Clean it up integrate, and at the end of the day, you end up with a number which would represent the, the surface integral. So questions about this particular example? Can you go up to the second step again? Yeah, gladly. Any questions about this, Joseph? I just wanted to see what it what it what, what it meant again. Yeah, got it. So this is representing finding the area of that parallelogram that we talked about yesterday. All right, so let's continue on. Um, so a little bit of notation here. I find that one of the confusing parts about, the, um, about this particular material is that here we have the little s, little s, and here you have big S. You're like, well, what's the difference? Right, and so little s has to do with arc length. The formula is that it's the derivative of uh, the parameterized function times dt, um, and that's our magnitude. ds is very similar, but here you're gonna have a cross product and a da. Um, 
if it helps, if you don't like all the t's, you can just remember it as partial of r with respect to u cross partial of r with respect to v. But writing it this way, I think you can see that the two formulas parallel each other, the two systems parallel each other. Parallel each other. It's just, once again, we have, um, I think the phrase we've been using is that we lifted our, we raised ourselves up a dimension. So one more dimension. Question about, questions about little d or d little s or uh, d big s. Very good. All right. Oh, any questions? Turn the audio. All right. So let's set up another example. Um, this particular example is uh, conceptually is it's pretty similar. I want to spend the time on the on the setup part of it. Um, so specifically, here we're given a, a surface and we're not given the parameterization directly. So we have to come up with our own parameterization. And so the first thing you want to do if you're given some sort of equation is probably, it's not going to be always, but probably you're going to want to solve for z. And so we solve for z, or if you will, you can think about this as being in the form z equals f of x, y. And so when you have it in that form, you can parameterize, and you can use a super simple parameterization of letting x be x, y be y, and then z be the function um, that, we, that we'd found. If, if you prefer, you could think about this as u, v, and f of u, v. Questions about that? Very good. So then we simply follow through the same process. We'll find zx, and then we'll find zy, and then we will find zx cross zy, and then we will find z magnitude, which is root three. And going, thinking back to chapter 16 um, in multiple integrals, what does this root three represent uh, in the context of of chapter 16. You guys remember, what was our term? What was the question? So what does the square root three represent? The magnitude? It's a magnitude, but if we wanted to tie it back to things that we were talking about before, this would be like that scaling factor. Ah, oh, scaling factor. I bring back some old memories. A little bit. Yeah. That's cool. So it's kind of the same thing that, we, that we've done in the past. So you find your parameterization, you find your scaling factor, and then you simply substitute and integrate. The one, probably the only touchy part here is, um, is to remember about setting up your limits of integration. So remember what that what those limits of integration would represent. So those limits of integration are saying that your y values are going from y equals zero, which is down here, up to y equals one minus x. So here's y equals one minus x. So we were integrating this direction. And then the zero to one, of course, says that we're going from the left at x equals zero to the right at x equals one. And so uh, probably you've done a few of these in your homework by now, but um, it's been a while since we set up a double or triple integral. And so uh, suddenly that those uh, skills are going to come back in, in handy here in this in this chapter. Questions about this particular surface integral?
Very good. So one thing I want to point out in this question is that the original uh, function can be written as a, or the original surface can be described as a function z equals f of x, y. And so this type of situation shows up a lot. And so there's kind of a nice, um, I don't know, shortcut formula, if you will, to help you evaluate a surface integral in this situation. So here's our little theorem. So the evaluation of surface integrals of scalar valued functions on explicitly defined surfaces. Uh, that's a lot of words um, that basically are saying that you have a surface S that's given by Z equals, I guess, G of X, Y. And so in that case, you're gonna do this same parameterization. So notice your X value is X, your Y value is Y, and your Z value would be the G of X, Y. And if you work all the way through all this stuff, you will discover that the scaling factor simplifies down to to this root partial of z with respect to x, partial of z with respect to y, with both of those terms squared plus one. Uh, you can derive it yourself, but basically we did a specific example of it above. Um, questions about this formula? Very good. All right. Uh, again, I want to make this this note. It's it's not difficult, but it's a big deal. So if you're trying to find the area of a surface, this function f here is just going to be one. Wait, I have a. So does this uh, formula? Is it only used for specific shapes or? It would, this particular formula would be for any shape provided it can be, the surface can be described as Z equals G of X, Y. Okay. So if I said, so for example, uh, in the previous question, I said, here's a plane, you know, here's the equation of a plane we solve for Z. And so we got it in this form. Um, in the next example, if you look down below, you can see, um, you can see the z equals uh, root x squared plus y squared. So it's in the form g z equals g of x y. So again, we could use this formula. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Very good. So yeah. So again, on the surface area issue, again, if you're trying to find the area of a surface. You're simply going to replace the the function here um, with with one. Uh, not hard, but important. Uh, here's here's why this particular theorem is valuable. It's valuable because, as you can see in example three, um, which step of our process did we start with? We've had this. We had this three-step process for most of this chapter. What step did we start with here? Parameterization. Parameterization. Usually, we're always starting with parameterization, but do you see any parameterization happening here in this worked out solution? We got, no. No, not so much. Here, it's like we start straight with step three. Substitute and integrate. Substitute and integrate. Because since we, since we already have the function in this particular form, it's like we already know what the, what the parameterization would be. We mm -hmm. already know what that scaling factor is going to be. And so it's just a matter of uh, going straight to step three. And well, I'm sorry, what identifies this again? Could you tell us? Yeah, this is, this is your friend. So again, the key is, is that in this case, it's written as Z equals. Can you can you write and you could also accomplish the same thing if you'd written it in y equals or x equals form, 
you just would have to modify the formulas. But sweet, thank you. Yeah. Other questions about this? Very good. All right, let's just look briefly at this derivation. Um, Again, the actual working through of the question. Um, what I wanted to point out is that the, 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 the domain where our parameters live is this, um, I don't even know what, what do you call this shape? Um, this is an annulus? Is annulus. An annulus? Donut. Yeah, it's a flat donut. It's like the ones that I cook because I don't know how to get them to rise right. Um, but I think the math term is a is a annulus, uh, and notice that if we were describing that annulus um, uh, in Cartesian coordinates, you'd end up with something like this with one less than or equal to x squared plus y squared less than or equal to four. So this would be talking about circles um, that have be with radius between one and radius two. Remember this is equal to a, that's r squared there. And so um, this is how you would describe it in Cartesian coordinates. If you wanted to describe it more simply, you could use polar coordinates and then your radius would just go from one to two. Your thetas are gonna go from zero to two pi. But when we switch to polar coordinates, what do we have to remember to pick up? What's the scaling factor? Exactly, we need that scaling factor of R. Yeah. Questions about this? All right, so that's the basic gist of a surface integral. Now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna talk about the surface integral of a vector field. Oh my gosh. So just as we did with line integrals, we now need to move on to surface integrals of vector fields. So recall that in line integrals, the orientation of the curve we were integrating along could change the answer. The same thing is gonna hold true with the surface integral. So for a line integral, if you went counterclockwise, you might get one value. If you get clockwise, you might, you'll get the opposite uh, amount of work. So before we uh, really get into doing surface integrals of vector fields, we first need to introduce the idea of an oriented um, and when I say oriented in this case, I mean a two-sided surface. So uh, many of you have taken lab classes. Um, so in the spirit of lab classes, I thought it was important before I do this next demo to use the proper P -P PPE, is that right? So I have my, my safety glasses and I check my workspace to make sure it's clean. My lab partner is probably in some other building. Um, so I'm gonna take some ordinary scissors and a piece of paper. Can everyone, is this demo clear for everyone? I'm gonna cut, cut my paper roughly in a straight line and cut like two parallel cuts. Um, please don't try this at home without the proper, proper equipment. And then, um, watch this carefully, I'm gonna take my, my paper and I'm going to uh, fold it over and connect the two ends. And then I will take um, this product, it's sticky on one side, not sticky on the other, often called scotch tape. And and connect the two. And so I have this kind of like funky looking 
piece of um, paper, like a little swirl there. And so perhaps for the first time this quarter, I can use a, a whiteboard pen. Again, it's important to, to make sure you read the instructions. Um, people have known to get chemical highs off of these things. And so I'm gonna put my whiteboard pen down on one side. Ooh, it's gonna show through. Uh, maybe I'll go off on one side of the thing. So I'm gonna trace around on one side of the piece of paper. And what I want you to notice is that it's a little little difficult to see with the color because the ink bleeds through a bit. What I want what I want you to notice is that I started um, in one place and I went all the way through and got right back where I started but spanned both sides of the piece of paper the point uh, you guys know what this particular object is called Mobius strip. yeah it's a Mobius strip and so what's the key idea behind a Mobius strip? It's a, it's a, how many sides on the piece of paper? One. There's only one side of the piece of paper. Okay, now that I've done the whole demo, I can carefully set my PP, PPE aside. Um, so the Mobius strip is an example of a non-oriented surface. So this is a non-oriented surface. Um, that is, um, again, like a non-oriented piece of bacon. This means you don't have to flip the bacon because, um, uh, because it's, all, it's only got one side to begin with, which is kind of convenient. Um, so going back to our notes, back to the share. If we go back to our notes, the key with our non-oriented surfaces is that uh, whenever you see this phrase, oriented surface, you can translate that oriented surface to mean not a Mobius strip. Um, I'm guessing that when you start to draw surfaces, you probably weren't thinking Mobius strips in the first place, um, but this will just confirm that your intuitions are probably just fine. Questions about oriented surfaces? Will we be taking uh, surface integrals of Mobius strips? We will not. We will not. That would be something you'd have to play with in a much more advanced class. And a lot of the, that's a Mobius strip. The 3D version is called uh, a Klein bottle. Since I'm at work, here's my, here's my Klein bottle. The Klein bottle is a, like it's a four dimensional, there's, if you play with it, there's neither an inside nor an outside of the Klein bottle. So it's kind of probably difficult to read, but you can, uh, uh, it's, it's got a little um, gauge thing on the side and it has zero milliliters in the Klein bottle. Let me see if I can quickly find a link. Um, there's a, a very funny guy that, has, that sells Klein bottles. And he's got some very, like he's got this robot that drives underneath his house that picks up his Klein bottles and all that kind of stuff. So let's see if I can, yeah. Um, for those of you that have seen Back to the Future, this is as close as I feel like I've ever gotten to Doc. So 
there's the link in the chat for those of you that need some entertainment for after class. All right, so continuing onward and upward. So let's start off with a surface that has two sides, which means that it has a tangent plane at every point, except possibly along the boundary. Um, as, as the tangent plane because it's a surface. Um, and because we assumed it has two sides, um, there's going to be these two normal vectors. And so uh, you can see here you've got some surface, and there's two normal vectors. Normal vector number one is pointing you know, up. Normal vector number two is just going the other direction. And the relationship between the two would be that normal vector two would be the negative of normal vector one. So far, so good. So if the unit normal vector varies continuously over the surface, then we say S is an oriented surface, like we were talking about earlier. Uh, the set that we choose will give the surface an orientation. So there's two possible orientations. Basically, all this stuff about orientation is we got to ask ourselves, which way is up? Um, and this seems like a very silly question. And then if you think about all those uh, simulations, like flying simulations or uh, spacewalk simulations that maybe you played with uh, on a computer, you realize that trying to just make sure that your orientations are right, that you know which way is up is, is a bit of a challenge. So um, that's what all this stuff is trying to do is make sure you know what direction is up. So we continue on. So suppose S is a smooth orientable surface, not a Mobius strip, given in parametric form by R of UV. Since the normal vector is perpendicular to the tangent plane and TU and TV are on the tangent plane, the normal vector is their cross product. So unitizing it will get the unit normal vector. So TU, TV, this right here. So if you think about your surface, maybe above. So here's your TU, here's your TV. Those are both on the surface. So then we find this puppy right here. It's perpendicular. Boom, boom. That's our n vector that's normal. It's who knows what the length is, so we divide by the magnitude to make sure that we get a unit normal, uh, the unit normal vector. Questions for how where this formula came from? Very good. All right. So unless otherwise specified, we will assume that we have upward orientation, um, that that would be the direction of n, and the downward orientation would be a negative n. Similarly, if we have a closed surface, we'll assume that, assume that positive orientation points out of the closed surface. So if you have a, something closed, you assume the normals are going out uh, all the way around the object. So now we're ready to talk about the definition of surface integrals of a vector field over S. Um, and this is equal to, conceptually, what we're looking at is uh, the normal component of the field over S. And it's used to calculate flux. So remember, before flux was tied to divergence, it was pointing to how much was the normal component, perpendicular component. Um, same thing is happening here. All right. So definition, if F is a continuous vector field defined on an oriented surface S, not a Mobius strip, with unit normal vector N, then the flux is calculated using the surface integral of F over S. Uh, notice here, this S is a, uh, it's a big S, but it's also a vector. That's a vector quantity. So remember that when we were finding work, we had f dot dr, and those were both vector quantities. 
now we're going to have we're going to parallel that with a surface integral that was over c surface integral across s of f dot dot ds it's kind of paralleling so this one gave us work this one down here is going to give us flux. Okay. So what is ds with the, the vector quantity? ds would be n, that's like a direction, it's an oriented surface. So this is our ds with the arrow on the top. How do we find n? that n, again, here's our n. We have, had a formula for n. It's tu cross tv over magnitude. And then we also had a formula for ds. ds is tu, t, tu cross tv magnitude dA. Yay, the magnitudes cross out, leaving us with this formula right here for flux. Questions? Very good. So again, conceptually, what is, how do we uh, understand flux before we Keep going. Like what does flux represent? The normal component of a surface? It's not quite the normal component of the surface, but you're, it, it does include surface and it does include normal. Has to do with work? Um, there's got to be a field. So the flux would be the normal component of the field across the surface. So you've got some surf, you, you're, you're immersing the surface inside some sort of a vector field. And we're asking how much of that field is perpendicular to the surface. Something like that. How much of the field is perpendicular to the surface? How much of the field, here's the field F, is perpendicular to the surface and the dot product um, is helping us to, to grab that. Sweet, thanks. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. Cons the actual doing is just writing. It's not, it's nothing to be, um, be intimidated by. So in example four, I give you the same surface as before. So uh, let S be the surface defined by X equals U cosine V, Y equals U sine V, Z equals V. And suppose the F is, sorry, S is oriented upward. Find the flux of the flow field, and then I give you this field here. Uh, so in the previous example, uh, back in, I think it was example one, we did step one. Step one was to parameterize. That was already done for us. So here's your step one. So there's step one. And then in example two, we also worked through, um, we worked through and found the formula for ds. And so this is our step two. Um, that was just already done for us. And so we get to basically dive straight into step three in this case. And so our flux is going to be the, the field. Here's big F. Here's big F. And 
then this thing over here, this would be the TU cross the TV. And we're just going to dot them, see where it takes us. So uh, when you do that dot product, you end up with a scalar, right? There's no more vectors uh, down below. And um, happiness is when lots of things cancel. So we ended up with a cosine V, sine V, minus sine V, cosine V. Um, and so we ended up with this nice, simple little uh, integrand here uh, in this particular instance. And at the end of the day, we're going to get this pi over 6. And again, that pi over 6 would represent the uh, normal component of the field F uh, across the surface S, something like that. I'm seeing Damon's question about z equals u. Because it says uh, z equals v uh, uh, at, the, at the top there. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. Um, just I'm trying to catch up with you. Just been looking at this right here. This right here would be a, that would make, if this one's a V here, when I put it into the field, that would make this one a, a V there. Is that correct? And which would make Yeah, there's something there's something a little bit fun. The the concept is right. There's something wrong in my U's and V's. Um, I will I'll the first problem it. had Z equals U. So uh, okay. I I will I will work through that after class and update my notes. I don't think that this will hold you back from understanding what's going on or the calculations. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Thanks, Damon. Any other questions or corrections? Very good. Just like we had the, the special version of the, the surface integral formula when the surface was given explicitly. We also have a version of that flux formula when z is given in the form. Again, here z equals when z equals g of x, y. We can simplify all this stuff down and get a consistent formula for t x cross t y. Here's the here here would be our consistent answer for step two unitize it, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this particular case, we have a, a nice, concise formula for flux. And this works when your formula is z equals something. So z equals g of z of, sorry, g of x, y. Okay. Um, and so the last example simply uses this formula. So here, notice the surface is given as z equals. Since it's z equals, we can simply use the formula above and it's kind of plug or play, plug and play. So kind of just work through it, integrate, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I think Full disclosure, I got sick of integrating by the t in my notes. So I want to say that I used uh, Wolfram Alpha here or Mathematica. So um, this is, I just, 
I just couldn't take it when I was doing my notes over the weekend. I was like, I just can't write 16 more steps of integration today. So there I am being honest. Uh, sorry, Twee. Questions about all this stuff? Even math te teachers get tired of integrating. Yep, it's true. Yep, we do. All right, so let me see if I can sum up this section pretty, pretty quickly for you, just in terms of the key formulas. So we go all the way back to, to the beginning of the, sec of, the, of the section. The, in terms of remembering what's going on, everything we're doing here just parallels what we did with line integrals. So line integrals had some formulas, these are surface integrals, it's kind of the same thing. We spent a whole bunch of time just talking about how to parameterize. And it's, it takes practice, it's not that big a deal. Like it's not something to be intimidated by, it just takes some practice. Uh, one of the key examples, and this one that comes up a whole bunch in, these, in what we were just talking about, is that if you have your surface described as z equals g of x, y, then that's going to simplify your parameterizations and it's going to simplify some of your later formulas. So that was kind of the first bit. So then we worked through our surface area derivation and we had patches and we had parallelograms and we did all of this stuff so that in the end of the day we could find um, we could find this formula here. So here's kind of like our first big uh, formula for evaluating line integrals. So like, okay, great. We can evaluate a line integral. Notice this is, this is the little f. It's not a vector field. That's the key part about these surface integrals. So surface integral, not a vector field. And we had our note about surface area. We kept going. And we noticed that somewhere here, we said, again, if we have this situation where your surface is given explicitly, then formula one simplifies. So this is like uh, formula two, and it's version, it's formula one, but simpler. And it's simpler because we're in this special situation where, um, where z equals g of x, y. Like, great, we can work through it, no big deal. And we talked about oriented surfaces, basically said, don't do math over Mobius strips, it's a pain. And at the end of the day, we came up with, not quite the end of the day, but near the end of the day, we came up with formula three, which was this one for flux. And again, it gives you the normal component of the field across some given surface. Great, that's all fine and dandy. Let's keep on going. And here at the end, we had formula number four. And this is a special case of the flux formula, um, specifically for the instance where z equals g of x, y. So it's like you have two main formulas. Formulas one and three give you the surface integral, give you flux, and then you have special cases for the case where the surface is equal to g of x, y. Um, so fair amount of writing, some integration, definitely some multiple integrals. Um, next week when we pull this together, we will learn some ways to connect surface integrals to line integrals, uh, which is pretty cool with Stokes' theorem. Definitely stoked about talking about all that. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, there's enough in flux, not the least of which being my internet going out this morning. Uh, and so there's lots for you to work on, lots to think about. Uh, and so I just wish you a, a wonderful weekend. Um, enjoy the beautiful weather, work hard, finish strong. For those that are interested, feel free to hang out and talk about COVID. Uh, but I look forward to seeing all of you on Monday for your presentations. Take care, everyone. See you, Dusty. Take care, Titus. Bye, Dusty. Goodbye, Tweet.
I'm just glad that I, I uh, wasn't the only one with issues with internet today. I oh, was like no. scrambling trying to get like my phone set up for a hotspot. <laughs> oh, weird. So are you on your phone now? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Are you also on Comcast? Yeah. Um, I, I, I live by, by uh, Freddy's, so I think this, this area is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that's where we live too, right? Yeah, interesting. I, I want, there was a few less people on the, in class today than I would have expected, and so I wonder if, if there were others as well. Yeah, when I, when I uh, went to their website on my phone, I said there's like 500 people who were uh, mm -hmm. offline from it. So. Got it. Got it. Well, good job pulling together the hotspot. Um, I was not going to risk it with my brick. I was like, oh, I'm just going to come in. Is it up yet or not yet? No, it's it's still uh, it's it's still down. Okay. Yeah, I I feel my my poor family. They're home. Like the good news is there's one less person around, so I'm not there to get on everybody's ner you know to get on anybody's nerves. But at the same time, now four people are at home and with no internet, and I think that. It's almost a, uh, a life crisis these days, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. All right. Are you guys up for spending a few minutes on the COVID stuff? Yep. Cool.